Jamie, the Head of Advocacy and Communications here at Breast Cancer Foundation. So happy that all of you can join us here at for our first Fireside Chat celebrating this special month of International Women's Day live on Facebook and Instagram. Breast Cancer Foundation, or we call ourselves BCF, is a non-profit social service agency that advocates for early detection for breast cancer and supports the breast cancer community here in Singapore. We are privileged to have Singapore's well-loved celebrity artist and theatre director Pam Wee to share her personal story and moderate this evening's chat. I'll now hand the time over to her to introduce the rest of the panel and get the ball rolling. Over to you, Pam. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Breast Cancer Foundation for having me. Um, I lost my mother to breast cancer at the age of 27, so uh, this topic is a very dear one to me. And I'd like to thank Breast Cancer Foundation for organizing tonight's fireside chat. Um, and I've always wondered why it's a, called a fireside chat, because in Singapore it should be an aircon chat. Um, but I'd just like to introduce uh, the, the wonderful panelists with me this evening. We have Evelyn Ong, who is a breast cancer survivor. We have Dr. Li Jingmei, who is a breast cancer researcher. And we also have Mr. Benjamin King, who is a, an artist, singer-songwriter uh, with Sony as well as Fly. So welcome, all of you. Um, and, and, you know, it's, we're going to cover a wide range of topics, I think, this evening, we want it to be very informal and want to just really actually be just a very casual chat. Um, but thank you all of us for joining us online, uh, first of all, uh, both on IG and Facebook. Um, maybe we start with some scientific facts first. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lee, um, what is the most, uh, what are the rates of cancer like in, in Singapore at the moment, breast cancer? Breast cancer is certainly a very big problem in Singapore. How big, you may ask. Yeah. It's the most common cancer among women. And the number of new cases of breast cancer um, diagnosed in Singapore is like the next two or three most common cancers combined. That is how bad. Wow. Yeah, and um, it's not just a big problem. It's also a growing problem. Why do I say that? It's because within the past 40 years, the number of new cases that are diagnosed every year has gone up by three times. Mm. So it's not just a big problem, it's also a growing problem, but the issue here is not about the problem, but what we, what we can do about it. Yeah. So in comes like mammography screening, which uh, we do have a national screening program, um, but the problem is that not enough women are going. Okay. So for an effective screening program, we need at least 80% participation rate. So, well, I'm going to stop here with the you know, statistics and numbers. I'm going to make this interactive. So I'm going to ask my fellow panelists and our moderator, what do you think is the participation rate of mammography screening in Singapore? You will get a prize if you get the closest answer. Wow. Okay, so what is the... Participation rate of mammography screening among Singaporeans. Okay, so how, what is the percentage of women who go for mammograms at the mammogram going age? Yeah, that's is correct. It? Okay, so that's like 40 and above, right? 50 and above. 50 and above. Actually, yes. Um, yes, Chris. Okay, so she's given us a clue and she said that it's like not, I don't think it's very high. I'm going to go at 15%. Ooh, that's bleak. Why are you clapping? Is that the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Got price, no? Got price, price. Okay, what do you think? Singapore okay. is too competitive. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. 15%. 15. I'm going to go with... Uh, 16%. This, <laughs> this is, is a gambler. This is, this is a gambler. Yeah. <laughs> about this is price is right. It's not, it's not price is right. That's a price, you know. Uh, I'm going to be a bit more optimistic. I'd okay. say it's probably about 35%. Oh. Oh, like, Find my price. The price is a box of chocolate. Oh, so wow. then participation rate or the number of people going, percentage of women going for at least one mammogram in the correct age group is... 40%! Hey! Yay! Not too bad, not too bad. Not too low. Oh, no, we'll that's not too bad. Yeah, we can share thank this. You, but you. the problem is, is, is that even though at least like 40% of the women who are supposed to go for mammogram mm -hmm. went for at least one mammogram, mammograms don't work if you don't go back for routine screening. It's yeah. like dental checkup, you see? Yeah. So if you go for one time, you, your dentist says that you know everything is fine. It's not, it doesn't mean that the next time when you go back, you don't find a cavity. Yeah. So you need to go for so routine screening. you have to keep on going back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the routine mammogram, the repeat mammogram rate is only about 15 to 20%. Right. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's closer to what we were guessing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But, um, but also, you get some chocolate. You can share. <laughs> but also, um, what what I wanted to uh, highlight was that we found out that actually in recent years, breast cancer is affecting uh, younger women, younger and younger. You know, and it's no longer a problem that is just for women above the age of forty. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about about that. What's happening? Why it's happening? Why are younger women? Are getting breast cancer today? That's an interesting question. I don't have the answer for it. Um, so the only uh, way we can, you know, take care of the problem is that we know our personal risk and do breast self examinations, for example, because mammography screening between age 40 to 49. Even though the national guidelines say that, uh, you know, women above age 50 should go for uh, uh, screening every two years, between age 40 to 49, you consult your doctor talk about the pros and cons of going for screening yeah. for mammograms, then you can choose whether or not you want to go every year. But below like age 40, then it's a different story because the, um, the technology doesn't uh, find cancers very well in younger women. Right. So then what we can do is like breast self-examinations, ultrasound, yeah. and maybe you know um, some of our other panelists can tell us more yeah. about it. So, so um, what we have actually, um, well, I've actually found out is that when breast cancer affects women below the age of 40, that means younger women, mm -hmm. um, very often it is a very aggressive type of cancer. So that's very worrying and which is why the monthly breast self-examination is so important. Um, and maybe I, I'll ask Eve to tell us a little bit more about her journey and how she discovered um, her cancer. Okay, happy to share. Um, I was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer at the age of 42 and it was really coincidental. I mean, I, I followed the guidelines. I started my mammogram when I turned 40. Um, and when I was 41, my mammogram was on in January. Um, and it was good, all clear, the doctors say nothing wrong, and I just go on with my life. Um, in parallel, I have another friend who had a relapse, and she was very upset because she had this entire journey. She had lumpectomy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and still there are still cancerous cells in her breast, so she was very upset. So we, a few of, uh, two of my friends, uh, and we organized a, a mahjong session just to cheer her up. And it was that night when we were playing mahjong, cheering her up, and I went back to bed, I went to sleep, and I thought that, you know, it has been a while since I last did my self-examination. The mammogram was in January, at that time it was already October. So I said, okay, maybe I should um, check to see if there's, if there's any lump. So the best part is, I didn't find the lump. I, I couldn't feel it. It, it, it seems perfect. And at the time I had a partner and I asked him to help me check. Because, uh, and he did, and he was very aggressive about it because I think men doesn't have this knowledge that you know, women breast hurts you know, when you press too hard. So he was just pressing and true enough, he found a lump which was uh, very close to the armpit. Um, and he told me that it feels like a lump. Is it? Is it a lump? And I, I don't know how it feels. I'm not sure is this supposed to be painful or um, hard or soft. And I, 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 I felt it myself. Yeah. And I have to and have to lift my, lift my armpit to really feel the lump. And true enough, there was the, it was there. So and, and I didn't. I didn't uh, do anything. I checked all my insurance policies, make sure that it's intact um, before I go see the doctor. Yes, so that's how I discovered the, uh, the tumor. And um, I saw the doctor send me for uh, um, biopsies and, and even the lymph node that's closest to the tumor was positive. So it was stage two and I have to have chemotherapy and I had a bilateral mastectomy as well. Mm. Yes. Can, can, can you uh, tell us why uh, you decided to have a bilateral mastectomy or was that something that the, the doctor recommended? Well, uh, the tumor is on one side. Um, through more examinations, there are actually unhealthy cells on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. So the doctor will explain like this is a healthy cell, this is a cancerous cell, and there are like five stages. Yeah. So mine was really like mutating like stage three. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of time before it turns cancerous. So never mind, just yeah. get rid of it, yeah. Do you, do you have a uh, cancer history in your family? A lot of cancer histories, but no breast cancer. My yeah. own dad passed away from pancreatic cancer. Okay. I had uh, another uncle pancreatic cancer, my grandmother lung cancer, mm. I had my auntie ovarian cancer, leukemia. Yeah. So it's all from the on-site, my dad's side of the family. Right. But there was no one with uh, breast cancer. 
Yeah, I was the first and definitely the first in my generation, the cousin's okay. generation. Okay, so, so then maybe I'll, I'll bring this over to Ben. Um, how old were you when your mother passed away? When she passed, I was 12. It was, um, it was uh, I think, three days before my PSLE. Oh so my it goodness. was, I didn't do too well. Oh my goodness. Um, how, but, how, yeah. how old were you when she first discovered that she had breast cancer? I was eight. I was eight. So she fought it for four years. Um, she discovered it at 40. She passed at 44. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. really young. Um, mm. Yeah. And, and how much of it do you remember? I remember a lot of it. Uh, it was very visceral for me because my mom, um, she's, she was very articulate about it. She was, also very, she was also a very emotional person, but she was able to sort of crystallize the experience in a way that I, as a young kid, would understand. Um, even my yeah. sister at that age. So, you know, and I would go from crying to, you have to understand why mommy is crying. And this is exactly what I am going through. And um, I, I wanted to share this story, it's so funny. She was so good at involving us in the process of her journey. Um, I remember the day she came back from, or she healed up from her operation, right? So she had a mastectomy as well. She had a mastectomy. She had uh, one breast removed. And I was, I was young, so I was in the shower with her at the time. And I was, it was going to be the first time I saw uh, the scar. So she did this silly thing, which I will always remember. She draped one towel over the side of her shoulder. So it was, you know, it was the side that was, um, that was cut. And then she was like, um, and she role played. She was like, well, honey, you look ravishing today. Then she flipped the towel and she pretended to be a woman. She was like, oh, stop it. And she did this whole like, silly role play. And like, it immediately like, demystified a lot of things for me. Mm. Uh, she was very candid about the whole process. Even, even though I was in primary two or three, um, I was brought to the world of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I, I was made to understand um, the struggle she was going through and the eventual you know, um, uh, decline. So I was prepared for it. It, it, it still hurt, obviously. Yeah. But um, it made me feel like I was a part of it. It made me feel very involved. Um, and that's why I feel like I'm so invested in the journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine. I, I lost my mom when I was 27. And it really felt like the end of the world. So I, can ima I can't imagine what it's like for a 12-year-old to you know, have to experience that as well. It's, um, you never get over you it. Never get over yeah. it. Yeah, and you miss your mom every day. Yeah. Uh, so how, how um, would you say your dad supported her at that point? Oh, man. Um, oh, he's the best. I, I, it was so hard because financially, it was just such a burden. I remember there was a day where and I don't think we were fully covered as well. Mm -hmm. So it was a day where I just remember him walking away from an ATM because we were just down to almost nothing. Um, but at the same time, you know, it was a conversation with my mom. She wanted a certain kind of treatment, obviously, and it was hard to say no to that. Um, but he was there from the first to the last treatment, uh, and he was there on the day as well. So, yeah, he was really supportive. He was really all that we could ask for in that journey, yeah. Um, what about you, even? What about? You, you know, you, you mentioned that you had a, a partner, and I realized that it's past tense. <laughs> you had a partner who helped you discover the lump. Um, yeah. So what happened in, in that yes. support journey? So um, I think the word to describe was uh, disappointment, um, because he was not very present during my initial journey. Um, because I was diagnosed around the end of the year. So there was a, it, he was already planning to visit his family overseas. Um, and of course, I got a diagnosis and I got my treatment plan. I have to start my chemotherapy. Um, so one would expect your partner to change your travel plans and be there with you, right? To go through the chemotherapy and the side effects and whatnot. Um, but he didn't. And uh, instead of you know, changing or cancelling the trip, he even asked to extend the trip. So he was basically mm -hmm. absent for the first two cycles. Um, and uh, but I was not alone. I was I have my family and friends. Yeah. Um, but that was I, I would think that you're thinking you're like, I'm going through this <laughs> physically and emotionally, and I would really like my partner to be busy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I I I for for me, I was 27 when my mom um, passed away. But uh, the the six years that she spent 
fighting that. You know, I was in university, everyone is like, and, and there's a, there was a lot of guilt as well. Like, if you're not able to accompany mom every time to a chemotherapy session, which is, can be three, four hours long. Mm. My dad had, had, was a stroke patient, so he, he found difficulty walking. So it was like, um, when I look back, she, she had to attend a lot of chemo sessions on her own. Um, I, I do regret that, but um, you know, she's, she was a very strong, independent woman, and um, she, she, she always said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you've got to go to school, you've got to go to school. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting there, like, receiving chemo anyway, so... But, um, maybe at this point, I'd like to bring up the fact that Breast Cancer Foundation has a befrienders um, a group. If you find yourself alone, or if you find yourself uh, not being able to talk about this uh, to anybody close to you, um, Breast, uh, Breast Cancer Foundation does offer an emotional support group. Um, where there will be a one-on-one -on -one befriender situation, um, uh, you're matched. You'll be matched according to your profile, and uh, the befriend befrienders are actually breast cancer survivors themselves who are trained in basic counselling skills. So, if you find yourself alone in this journey, or you know someone who is alone in this journey, please reach out to BCF um, um, for this befrienders um, uh, situation. This befrienders group. Uh, there are also actually these um, other amazing uh, groups that uh, Breast Cancer Foundation um, uh, on the second Saturday of every month there are these support groups that come together and uh, they actually cater to different types of people English speaking, Mandarin speaking there is the young women's group uh, and there's also the caregivers group where, where a lot if you're a, 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 a husband struggling with um, somebody who is a breast cancer patient or a son uh, or there, there is a special breakout group for men um, to, to talk about what they are going through as well. And there's also an advanced stage cancer um, support group. So there are all these wonderful uh, uh, programs and groups that are available at BCF. So please do reach out if you feel that you, you need some help. Um, so I noticed also even you are wearing this uh, yeah. very bright pink jacket. Yes. Um, uh, I have a friend who, who had breast cancer at the age of 26 and then she very gung ho joined this dragon boat team. <laughs> yeah. like, hello, you, hello, what's happening? So what I found out is that dragon boating is a very encouraged uh, sport for women who are uh, recovering or uh, um, in remission from breast cancer because it activates Maybe you can show us <laughs> and you can tell us. Okay, 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 okay. I'll show off. Is it like? Okay. So what's the action? Why, why, why dragon boating? Okay. So oh, wait, and what's your group called? Paddlers in the pink. P I P. Not paddlers in pink, but paddlers in the pink of health. Yay! Yeah. Can the camera see? Yay. Yeah, I get it. Yay. <laughs> yes. So um, many of us breast have uh, breast cancer survivors. We do have our nodes removed because that's usually the next part right after it's spread and um, if you have a lot of lymph nodes removed then there is a chance the chances of getting lymphedema is very high so lymphedema is the swelling of hands so dragon boating with that action sort of you know activates that upper body movement and it keeps it active so in addition so in Singapore we have the PIP paddlers in the pink um, but this is actually a very popular sport worldwide every four years there is an international race for all dragon boaters around the world, for all breast cancer survivors. Wow. So wow. once every four years, we represent the Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. How's our How's our Singapore team doing? Not bad, not bad. Not bad. Pretty good. Because yeah. uh, in the water, uh, Singapore <laughs> very competitive. This one is an uh, ex-national swimmer. Then, uh, <laughs> then like, you know, like this, like sailing, la, you know, swimming, la, Joseph schooling, la, this paddling, yeah. like water sports. Lose, sports uh, Benjamin schooling? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... I, what I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Lee was that, you know, um, the monthly self-checks are so important mm. and it's so easy to just be complacent about it and think that everything's okay. Um, but what I found out from all our chats is that women hitting the age of 20, you should be already doing your monthly breast self-check every month. So maybe we could have a demonstration on like, you know, like how we should go about it so that we, we, we can share with our um, people who are live on IG and Facebook now what's the proper way of doing a, a breast self-examination. Do we have material from the Breast Cancer Foundation maybe? Yes, you can definitely go 
on the Breast Cancer Foundation site for, for um, uh, there, there's a page that teaches you how to do it. But if I'm not mistaken, you, have, you should do it in the shower or lying down, right? And you should do in circular motion. And you go from out all the way up to your armpit, lymph nodes, and then you go all the way in, working your way in towards the nipple, correct? And don't be gentle about it, like what you mean yeah, said, you have yes. to press be down. aggressive. Yeah. And, then, and then you go down and up and then to the sides. So basically just cover all parts of your breast, circular, then up, down, right, left. Um, and the only, and you know the breast is lumpy, there, there are some natural lumps in there anyway, but um, if you examine yourself monthly, then you will know when the lump feels different. Hey, wait a minute, this wasn't here last month. Uh, Okay, I'll monitor. Then the next month, if you know what I mean, if you keep on monitoring, that's how you detect um, breast cancer early. When you detect breast cancer early, um, the chances of uh, uh, treatment and recovery it goes up to ninety percent. Mm. Am I right? Stage zero, stage one, chances of like surviving for five years after diagnosis is above ninety percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The earlier you detect it, the treatments are less aggressive. Uh -huh. You have yeah. a better quality of life. Okay. Chances of survival is very high. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there any other signs that you would like to share with us? Like, um, I, I think recently we found out from WHO mm. has said that breast cancer has uh, surpassed lung cancer. Surpassed is the number one cancer in the world right now. Among women. Among women. Mm. Among women. Mm. Okay. So it has surpassed lung cancer. Is now the number one cancer mm. among women, and and that is is quite worrying. Um, is there any other um, signs that you would like to share, that a little known fact or um, about breast cancer that we should know about? Common misconceptions about breast cancer, what do you think? Is like um, people think that young people don't get breast cancer, mm. but that we covered already. Mm -hmm. um, we have more and more young people getting yeah. breast cancer. And it's important that um, young women take care of their breasts as well. It's like, you know, preventing wrinkles, right? You don't want to do it when the first wrinkle appears. You want to prevent it. Of course, we cannot prevent breast cancer, but at least we can detect it early. Mm, right. So the breast self-examinations are important. The other thing is, of course, um, they think that men don't get breast cancer. But among 100 breast cancer patients, there will be one man, one male breast cancer patient. Mm. Yeah. Other misconceptions are like, you know, breast size. You know, some women think that they have a smaller, smaller breast. They won't have like a high risk of breast yeah, cancer. That's, that's not, not true. true. At all, mm. yeah. yeah, there's no link between like breast size and uh, breast cancer risk. Yeah. Mm. Um, I I wanted also to to ask Ben, um, how how do you think um, men could help or support um, watching the uh, having having experienced the fine example of your father. Um, and I know recently that you have you have been through um, uh, the death of a, a close friend. Um, mm. How how do you think men can help or support? I think in both my personal cases, um, uh, the breast cancer warriors were very articulate about it, you know, and they were very ready to share their stories. So we were very involved. But I. I liken it to someone who is, you know, I mean, obviously it's very complex and different, but it's going through um, a very life-altering hard time. And it's not just being there uh, um, empathetically, emotionally, it's also just helping to pick up the pieces where they fall. If, if it's in the family, my dad was chaperoning us to school and swim training. He was being, you know, he was helping Nirelle through her first, you know, her puberty stages. He was being a mom, essentially, as well. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, I'm just being there, responding well, um, and and it's also, I think, very important to to understand how you feel about it as well. Yeah. You know, it's creating space for yourself. Tell us about tell us about the thread that you were you were talking about. Yes. Earlier. This is this is bad. So, we were just talking about it over there in that in the living room. I was on Facebook. Um, I was on no, I think I was on Twitter as millennials do, and uh, there was this very in, incredible thread of um, of. I want to say um, it was mostly from, from kids' perspectives, but it was of, uh, of people who, again, gone through cancer, um, and it was stories of their, their partners leaving them in different stages, whether it was um, at, at the tail end of their, of their journey or just at the embryonic stages, these guys would just, and it was all men. Yeah. <laughs> it was like 15 uh, yeah. like versions of so, different men so, left. So I find this interesting. So instead of just like slamming the men, for, but I, I really do feel it's a whole culture of men not being able to express themselves, uh, not open to expressing themselves emotionally. And as a result, 
through a whole lifetime of not expressing yourself properly when something traumatic happens, you freak out and then there's a it's lot flight, of flight yeah. um, as opposed to staying to fight. So I think we have to equip boys and men to start uh, expressing themselves um, more articulately. I think it has mm -hmm. to start there. And, and, and that, I guess, is a whole other conversation. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask Eve then, uh, up front, what not to say <laughs> to someone who has just discovered they have breast cancer or someone at cancer going through, going through treatment, what not to say? You know, a lot of people are shocked when they find out their friend um, has cancer, but Dr. Lee was just saying one in five people um, will develop cancer. One in three in their lifetime. One in three. Any kind of cancer, and then one in three of that one in three would get breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, that is a very, very like scary statistic. It is so common. I think all of us will know somebody who has cancer, had cancer, passed away from cancer. We all know someone. So, um, as a survivor, I'd like Evelyn to tell us what the do's and don'ts of the people around uh, breast cancer. Uh, survivor or patient? You know, that's a very good question because myself, sometimes I struggle after I found out someone has a new diagnosis. Sometimes I feel myself struggling to say the right words as well. So, but from the other side of the equation, um, um, I, it, I think it really depends on your relationship with that person. And I think most of my friends know that I'm very uh, open, I'm very jovial and um, I'm very positive and I just go through the treatment and go through life. So their messaging to me is also very lighthearted. Mm. Some, some who don't know me that well, like maybe colleagues, they will like, um, how are you, pray for you. So I think all these are good and I think what really matters is um, whatever messages you send to your friend who's just newly diagnosed, I think it's important that you're, you're sincere about it and uh, you show some empathy in it. Um, and when I say empathy, it's, it's very important because um, just to share with you, when I was going through chemo and I had, I'm bald and stuff, I received a text message from a friend. And this friend has been friends for uh, three decades, my okay. primary, secondary school friends. And she's, the text came in like, Eve, I saw your picture on Instagram. I think you look better with long hair. No! <laughs> oh my god! It's true! And I have to screenshot, I have to send to all my friends. Like, <gasps> Did she really was, see was, this? Was that friend aware that you were going through? Yes, oh, because she posted, she posted a photograph Are you still of friends? Oh, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, still friends. Yeah, yeah. sometimes people just, it just comes yeah, out. Exactly. So, okay, so I don't think... do that. Huh? <laughs> don't tell cancer patient that they look better at long hair. Don't do that. Don't do that. Or, mm, why are you so skinny? Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just be a bit sensitive. No, did you like it's to not by choice that we are bald, you know. Yeah. What was your favorite? What was the favorite thing that you heard? Favorite thing? I think um, I, I, I'm Catholic, so I do like uh, when people say that uh, they, they pray for me and mm. they dedicate a mass for me and, yeah. and stuff like that. I think that's very touching and sincere. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when uh, my my mother was in remission for two years, and when the cancer came back, I remember telling a close friend on the phone. I was I was quite distraught. I I, I was telling her on the phone. Uh, my mom's cancer is back, and her reaction was, you're kidding! And I really flipped. It was like, why, why would I be kidding about something like this? I mean, she didn't mean it as, your, it really meant, she meant, oh no! But it came out as, you're kidding! And I, I, I flipped. Uh, it was just not a nice thing to hear. Um, and in, in my family, there were the, my, my dad and mom made jokes about it too, because my, my mom would leave her, what's, what's that called? The, the, what's it called, doctor? <laughs> so, I the forgot the word. The, 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 the fake boob. Uh, silicon? The silicon boob. The silicon <laughs> boob. The thing that you put in your bra. <laughs> yeah, so the, the fake boob. You just leave it on the table. Then we're like, you know what I mean? We're just like, we'll like play with it just sometimes. Play, yeah. Juggle with it. it. And, and, and my, my parents had this thing called, uh, they used to call her the one arm swordsman. And like, you know, the, <laughs> so I mean, there was a lot of humor in my house. So we just have different ways of, of dealing with it. Um, but I, I don't know, Ben, as a child, I mean, were, were they very insensitive? You know, I, I'm, I'd like to address uh, people who have children yeah. um, out there who might be affected by, by uh, breast cancer. Um, were there any experiences that... I, I say one thing that I would, I would always remember. I just wish I took it back. 
because my mom was so self-conscious as well. She was always trying to lose weight. She was always in a state of trying to lose weight, always checking her double chins in the mirror and all that kind of stuff. And then I remember when, you know, when, again, when, uh, when the cancer came back and she had dropped a ton of weight and then I said the most insensitive thing. But I was 10, all right? Yeah. So I was like, hey, mom, it looks like you got your weight loss after all. Oh, no. <laughs> and like she... Oh, no. She laughed, but then she started. She she laughed into a crying. Yeah, oh no! Yeah, <laughs> and she yeah. literally did that, and I was like, "Wow, I hate yeah, myself yeah. so much." But okay, yeah. But, but okay, so that was a thing that you said you were ten. Okay. I was yeah. 10, just, yeah, yeah, you just yeah, yeah. blurted it out. But, but, I, yeah. but I saw the impact it had on her. Yeah. It really got her. Um, okay. Yeah. What, a very soft spot. Yeah. But what would you? How would you advise people who have children? What What would you say? How mm. How should they? address the issue of breast cancer with young children? What would you, Again, ha having been a child that went through it? Yeah, I think not everyone has the emotional capacity to open up uh, the way that, that my mom did, or you know, yes. that maybe your mom did as well, or maybe that you are doing. I think it's very admirable. Some people, they want to create that safe space. Mm -hmm. And it's also in our duty to recognize the need for that, to like give them that space sometimes, but also know that I'm here for you if there's anything you need. Um, but if you feel like you're in that capacity and, uh, to share, and you've got kids who are young, very impressionable, I would say just fill them in because it yeah. did me wonders and it, it really normalized the conversation for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, having uh, having experienced uh, quite a few friends passing from cancer, uh, there was an experience that um, my friend uh, had a brain tumor and she didn't want to tell the kids. Hmm. And I think that's actually harder. Please correct me. I think every family will have their own way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. But when you keep it away from the kids, and then when it it's in the late stage, and then you break it to them, then everything makes sense to them, and they felt they felt very mm, not part of it. In. Yeah, the and then journey. they were like, "Oh my god, now I'm on I'm I'm on a time frame that I have a shorter time frame," and then uh, it made them feel like they weren't important enough to to share this information with. Um, but I. I I I feel um, honesty sh should be. I mean, of course, there are different ways to 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 uh, present this information to to a child of different ages, and maybe uh, you can reach out to BCF um, for uh, the Befriend befrienders group to to teach you or to get just some advice on how to break this news to a child, how to guide the child uh, through your experience or your friend's experience or your family member's experience of chemotherapy and treatment. Uh, I would so also, also say at this point, if I can, that um, children are so obviously uh, sensitive to these things. Um, Narelle, when she was at that age, was only four or five, uh, but she was so intuitive with my mom's emotions. And I think the same way with, with other kids as well. We can sense that very strongly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so I think we are able to wrap this up now. I, I mean, any, any, any other thing that you would like to add? Any anecdotes? Um, uh, how, how many years have you been in remission, Eve? Uh, I was saying I was 2017, so this is my third, fourth year. Yay! Yes. You look amazing. Thank you! You look amazing. Your arms are very toned. Then you have yeah, yeah, a nice yeah, yeah. tan from uh, uh, Dragon, Dragon Ball. Yeah, Singapore very hot, you know. Yeah, and um, I, I really uh, admire your work that it's just, you're a breast cancer researcher, which is like so specific. Um, is there any kind of um, signs that you would like to point out that is specific to Singapore or uh, as, as opposed to the rest of the world with regards to breast cancer? Uh, first of all, the word you were looking for was implant, yes? Implant? <laughs> no, it's the, it wasn't an implant, it's the, the thing that you just... The prosthetic! prosthetic. Yes! I cannot decide between implant Brain and prosthetic, but yeah, you got it. Left yeah. us, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So I was telling um, Ben just now, um, so many of the breast cancer risk prediction models um, before a woman even gets breast cancer, you can like you know gauge the level of risk. It's just like blood pressure, right? You can measure your blood pressure. You know whether you're at a higher risk of like getting cardiovascular disease. You can also do that for breast cancer using genetics, or you can use like you know number of children, other non-genetic risk factors to compute the risk. So all these are usually developed in Europe on European populations. So yeah. what we do is um, we try to calibrate it to the Asian population, mm. see how well it uh, uh, performs, and whether we can tweak it to uh, fit our, our local population. Yeah. Also, Singapore is like made up of three different ethnic groups. We have Chinese, Malay, Indians, mm -hmm. and the breast cancer risk in each ethnic group is actually different. It's different. Mm. Right. It's the highest in Chinese. Right. So uh, then uh, among the Malays and Indians, it's uh, quite a bit lower. Oh. Yeah, so one in 13, one That's in 15. That's a genetic thing, you think? Um, it's also the culture, lifestyle, reproductive factors. Because mm. um, you know, um, 
families and Indians, they have bigger family, mm. so we have more children, and that would lower the breast cancer risk as well. Oh yes. So this is something that uh, very interesting. Jill from uh, Kiss ninety two, the DJ, wanted to ask me because she's a, she's a new mother. She's breastfeeding, yeah. a four month old. She discovered a lump, and then her doctor told her that. Uh, because she has breast cancer history in her family, um, the chances of uh, uh, breast cancer actually increase when you're breastfeeding um, initially. Is that true? So over a longer time, uh, breastfeeding will decrease the risk of getting breast cancer in the future if the woman hasn't got breast cancer then. Right. But that might be a transient increase um, in the risk you know, after the first child. Right. So maybe that's what the doctor is referring to. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So um, for for me, my for my family, my mother's side of the family has no history of cancer. Mm. So to her dying day, she was pretty convinced. Of course, it, we can never prove it. She was pretty convinced it was HRT, which is the hormone replacement therapy that mm. she was taking yeah. uh, because she was better pausing. Yeah. And she was convinced to her the her last breath that that was what caused it, you know. But that's that, that was my mom's journey. Um, and for Ben, you are newly married, and yes. there is a very important woman in your in your life yeah. right now. Um, uh, what what would you say to her or or, or the, your women, the the important women around? I mean. Um, you? Yeah, I know a lot of my friends actually around my age, uh, age group, 25 to 30, 32, who have found irregularities or, you know, lumps. I mean, most of them are benign. I've had two friends around this age who, are, who have gotten breast cancer as well. Yeah, please, please, please do your self-examinations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, don't yeah. skip on that, yeah, um, even please. at a young age, yeah. yeah. Please, please, please do And that. always ask questions. I mean, great resources from yeah. Breast Cancer Foundation and Dr. Lee as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's better to just be aware. So there's actually a lot of information on the Breast Cancer Foundation page. Please do check it out. Um, there is a whole page dedicated to how you should do your monthly breast self-examination. Um, and right after this uh, stream, we are going to be putting up a, um, uh, what should I say, a questionnaire, not questionnaire, contest. Contest. <laughs> Everybody, we are going to hold a contest. Breast Cancer Foundation uh, is giving away two sets of um, dining vouchers for a five-course private dining experience for four. That means times two means like two groups of four, eight people um, to, to dine at the nest at One Farrer. Um, and at this point, I just want to thank One Farrer Hotel and Spa for sponsoring this beautiful suite for us to have our uh, live stream. Um, but yes. Uh, more details of the giveaway or the, or the contest that will be found on IG and Facebook. You have to answer a few simple questions. You have to tag a few people. You have to follow uh, like that. Got a lot of instructions. <laughs> and then, but the prize is big. Uh, this uh, dining experience oh. is worth $650. <gasps> yes. So um, please do check out uh, BCF's IG and Facebook pages to find out how you can take part uh, in this contest. Um, also, there will be a QR code. Um, if you want to just support the work that Breast Cancer Foundation does, uh, please uh, scan that QR code and donate um, generously to the cause. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all the breast cancer warriors who continue to live boldly in their breast cancer journeys. Um, maybe I, I, I just want to uh, uh, round off by saying how um, Breast cancer has affected the four of us here in different ways, right? Uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off. How, it's, how it has encouraged me to live boldly is that when uh, my mother was diagnosed and when she finally passed, I decided that I would make the leap from architecture into the world of arts and be a full-time actor. It was a big leap in 1999, but it was her death that pushed me to live boldly. And my mom was a real superwoman and I'm just trying to live as boldly as, as she did. Um, what about Eve? What is your live boldly statement? Well, um, you know, after going through this experience, um, I tell myself whatever you want to do, whatever you want to try, just do it. Wherever you want to go, just do it. There's yeah. really no need to hold back. Yeah. Um, so when I was doing my chemotherapy, I learned a new music. I tried to learn a new musical instrument because I cannot play a single musical <laughs> instrument, and I failed. But you know, never mind. I tried, right? That's all that matters. So you know, I, I think from a survivor, I just feel that it, um, a cancer diagnosis is not the end of the world, and you know, just push through. 
um, the worst will be over and you know we still can live a very fulfilling life and being in the dragon boat team is very inspiring inspiring to me too the oldest member in my dragon boat team is 70 71 years old and she's still an active paddler most wow. of them are average like 50s and the 60s so you know I, I like to be with them and every day I look at them they inspire me so surround yourself with good people I think mm. it's very important that you get inspiration from your community and your friends yeah as well. great yeah yeah that's wonderful mm. thanks for that um, uh, Dr. Lee what's your live boldly statement you know people always ask me if you do breast cancer research does it mean that you know you know of someone very close to you with breast cancer I actually don't, mm. but I have a thousand reasons to do breast cancer research and that's because you know, every year in Singapore more than 1,000 cases of breast cancer are being diagnosed. Mm. So in doing my work, I'm, I hope that I can help other women live boldly, you know, live happily because breast cancer patients have got such high survival rates, you know, they can live so much better lives and such long fulfilling yeah. lives after their diagnosis. Yeah, so thank you for dedicating your life to doing the science and the research so that others uh, can ben. live boldly and live fulfilling life. Thanks for that. Ben, what's your live boldly? I mean, wow. Um, but I mean, first I just wanted to say how grateful I am for people like you who, who really push, uh, you know, the field of, of, of breast cancer research. And um, yeah, I um, well, besides the whole uh, accent switching thing, which my mom had so much fun with, right? <laughs> that story. Uh, I think it taught me to be a team player in those moments, you know, to really learn how to like support um, in the right way, uh, just to be there, um, just emotionally, uh, physically needed. And I, w I will admit, it took me a lot of years to recover. It wasn't a straight away live boldly. It wasn't oh, a big live bold yeah. moment. I mean, it fractured my understanding of faith, uh, spirituality, family, everything. But I understood that, uh, yeah, like. It, it's always a journey, and it's a journey easier, easier travel with loved ones around you who are, who are just there for you, yes. And um, what was your mom's name? Regina. Show us your tattoo. Yeah, she's here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the um, oh. RK Eating House in Serangoon. They <laughs> still don't want to sponsor me. Uh, but yeah, it's a name. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, Ben King with a tattoo of his mother on yeah. his wrist. Um, so. We just want to round off by saying that Breast Cancer Foundation is here for you, uh, for your families. They can provide support for you. They can be a companion. Uh, you can also reach out for more information at any time to uh, Breast Cancer Foundation. They are here for you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to all the panelists um, here this evening. Uh, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the week ahead. And mean, in the meantime, please live boldly. Good night. Yay. Thank you.